Hello everyone, my name is Miriam Kilmurray and I'm here to talk to you today about a book that I wrote a few years back. It's a World War I book, so if you're interested in that subject, this might be for you. It's called Era's World War I War Poet and you can just see it behind me here. It's about a famous poet in Ireland called Francis Edward Ledwich. Now, as it happens, he was born just a few minutes from where I live here. Um, I'm in a place called Drogheda, Drogheda to some of you. And uh, although I'm in County Louth, just 10 minutes down the road is what is now a museum dedicated to Francis Ledwich. Now, throughout my early years growing up, I knew about his pastoral poetry. So any kind of poetry that was um, featuring birds, the fields, flowers, a lot of codes were used um, back in the in, in the day to represent Ireland. So usually Ireland was represented through birds and symbols of that nature. So fell very much into what we call um, pastoral poetry today. However, there is a different story that has not always been told about this gentleman. Because, first of all, we need to know that he was actually the result of a quest by A.E. Russell and W.B. Yeats. At the turn of the century, they were looking for the new Burns of Ireland. So they were looking for a poet, a new poet, who could represent the tone, the colour, the accents and the dialect of the indigenous language, of course, of the country, which would have been Irish, but represent that through the English language. Because even then, and although this sounds like a very modern complaint, it was a problem back then too. They were very worried about the sanitization of the English language. They felt that that was unfortunately ripping the heart out of a lot of poetry. And so what they did was they decided that they were going to to go on this quest between them and they were quite competitive about it and it took them years before they eventually found Francis Ledwidge. Now in fact you could say that they found him indirectly through Lord Dunsany aka Edward Plunkett the famous novelist and playwright. Now, Lord Dunsany used to go to A.E. Russell's house. Every Sunday, A.E. Russell in Dublin would throw his house open for poets from all over the country to come and, and read poetry and listen to poetry. And they hoped they might find the Burns of Ireland in that mix. And indeed, Francis Ledwidge heard about this, made his way up to Dublin, didn't make a huge impact at first, but he spotted Lord Dunsany. Lord Dunsany had a castle fairly close to uh, us here in Meath. And so he decided, Francis decided to send Lord Dunsany a copy book full of poetry that he'd written. Dunsany was hugely impressed, got in contact with him, eventually brought him on board as his, if you like, a PA, taught him the ropes, put him through his paces, acted as his mentor, did all of his PR for him. He landed on his feet. He was absolutely overjoyed. And in fact, in April uh, 1914, he was officially launched on the scene as the new Burns of Ireland. 26 newspapers in the, news, in, in the UK took uh, the story. He was in newspapers all over the States. Huge support. And then just a few months later, war breaks out. And what you have to remember is that Francis Ledwidge was a nationalist and he really, really wanted home rule. I mean, it, it, this, this is a whole other story, a whole other side to him, but he was a staunch nationalist. However, as a follower of John Redmond, he did believe that it, and was convinced by Redmond's argument that the only way to secure home rule, which was about to, had been promised, it had been promised at this point. The only way to secure that was in fact to join up. Now, Lord Dunsany was already a captain in the Inniskilling Fusiliers um, and he was appealing to Francis not 
to go to war. In fact, he was going to pay him. He was on an allowance every month and he was paying him not to go. Unfortunately, Francis disobeyed that and just had to go. He, in conscience, he felt he had to do something. And as far as he was concerned, he was fighting for the rights of small nations. There was nothing much that Lord Dunsany could do about that. He didn't have enough sway over Francis when it came to nationalism. But he fought in at least three campaigns, Gallipoli, Egypt, Belgium. And he was unfortunately hit by a shell and killed outright on the 31st of July, 1917. Such a young life wasted. But here's the thing. Back in Ireland, back in Ireland, we had now had the uh, insurrection. So you had the 1916 rising, all but a, a failed one in the eyes of a lot of people. But once, of course, the poets and the playwrights were being killed, once they were being put in prison in the aftermath of the rising and taken out systematically and shot. That was a huge problem for Francis Ledwich in the years just before he died, because there he was off fighting for king and country in the hope that he could secure home rule for Ireland. And then he finds that his very best friends are being taken out and shot. So it's a hugely difficult time. The last few years of his life uh, presented huge uh, trauma and, and confusion on the subject of, of war and nationalism and what he should do next. In the meantime, he was being called a traitor in Ireland for having joined up. And likewise, his senior officers were also calling him a traitor. And indeed, he was court-martialed for his nationalism and for speaking out of orders to superior officers who, let's say, weren't sympathetic to nationalism. So, very complex time in the last few years of his life. But here's the thing. He had a capacity when at front lines, despite the roaring bombing and, and, and gunfire going on around him, he could focus and he could write poetry on bits of cigarette carton, on, 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 on envelopes, on whatever he could find. He could write and write and write. He was prolific. And what he did on his off time was he organized those poems into collections. He actually organized those poems into collections that served his canon of, of, of poetry later on. All of this was ignored. Over a hundred years, basically ignored. And when I was doing my masters, I felt I couldn't be, it couldn't be ignored much longer. Now, great people had written on him. Um, Liam O'Mara is one of his main uh, uh, biographers. Alice Curtain was the first one, the late Alice Curtain. But she did not want to give him the label war poet. I, on the other hand, felt that he deserved it. He'd written so much poetry from front lines to not offer it to him was completely wrong. It was, it was, it was difficult to defend, particularly now in the 21st century, where I would have had students and, and friends coming up to me and saying, you know, does Ireland not have any war poets like Siegfried Sassoon and Robert Graves and all of these people who turned out a very specific brand of poetry? And, and the answer was no. And up to 2010, 2011, if you Googled Irish World War I poets, nothing came up. If you Googled Ledwidge, he never came up with that label. So although labels are a bad thing, I'm not keen on labels, to not afford it to him after what he had done and the prolific writing, which, and here's, here's the kicker, he created his own hybrid form of Irish nationalist war poetry. It was unique. And it was swept under the carpet. So something had to be done. That's what I f focused on and, and then eventually turned the thesis into a book for anyone who's interested in poetry. 
you like poetry, if you're into the First World War, if you're into anything at all to do with war, this could be for you. And uh, I will leave it with you. It was my first outing <laughs> and it nearly killed me. Uh, and I, I certainly was unpopular for a while because I, I, I even up to the centenary and the, the armistice, um, there were a lot of people who were unhappy with the fact that I was using the name war poet to describe him. They didn't feel that that was right because there is a perception in some uh, literature circles among literati that uh, war poet by its definition is to do with promoting war, which of course is not correct. That's only one very, very minor interpretation of it. You know, war poetry is about war and to not allow uh, a, a man who has given his life and who wrote and wrote and wrote from front lines to not allow him and his collections from Gallipoli, from France, from Egypt, Ypres, where he was killed, to not allow him the title war poet. At this stage, it's criminal. And you have to just dismiss any other connotations that might go with it. He is being excluded from access, from, from schools, from colleges, from history groups, if, if this is not allowed to happen. He needs that label. So, if in some small way between 2011 and 2017, uh, I was able to contribute to that, then that's something I'd be very proud of. And, um, and I'm really glad I went that direction. So the book is on Amazon. I will leave it with you. And if anyone is interested, that's where you'll find it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's something I'm very proud of. And um, I, I hope whoever gets it will enjoy it. I don't have all of his books, all of his poems in there. Um, I, I have referenced all of the books that, that he has uh, referenced, all the biographies. Um, but I have only taken out key poems and put them in. There are loads of other war poems that he wrote, but I have about 15 to 17 in there that are key, that really argue his case. Um, so it is a little bit of an academic um, paper, but uh, still I, I've tried to make it as accessible as possible to people. And I will leave you with it there. Enjoy. Bye.